uh, John Stanfield and CI. Uh, for the overview of our project, uh, our main goal was to successfully interface a digital signal processor with a computer. Uh, we also wanted to design and implement a finite impulse response and infinite, uh, infinite impulse response filter on the DSP processor. Uh, then after that, we'd evaluate the filter with our simulations and compare them to our real-time results. Uh, this is our project process overview. Uh, Eli did all the designing of the filters that we we're going to implement and then simulating them in different types of software. Uh, I worked mainly with the hardware side of things and interfacing the boards with the PC and then trying to actually implement one on one of the boards. So the question is, what is a filter? Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a filter as a device that prevents some kinds of light, sound, electronic noises, etc. from passing through. Although accurate, this isn't very exciting. So a different way of looking at a filter is in the time domain. You, on the x-axis you would have time, and on the y-axis you would have amplitude, and you would have an input signal, and that something would happen to that signal, and you would get an output signal that's different. Although slightly more exciting than the definition, this doesn't really say very much, and it's kind of hard to look at. So a third way of looking at a filter is in the frequency domain, where instead of time being the x-axis, you have uh, frequency, hertz. So it's a little bit easier to see what's happening in this picture. Um, what's happening is you're passing a the low frequencies through and you're attenuating the higher frequencies. This is actually a low-pass filter. Uh, I'm going to talk about why you should do, why you want to use a filter. Um, Basically, for if you have different types of speakers like a subwoofer, you don't want to pass too high of a signal to it, or it'll really blow it up. Same as with a tweeter, you want to have a low or a high pass filter so you don't send a too low of a signal to blow it up. Uh, basically, the process is very simple. You have your input, and then it goes to your analog to digital converter, which converts the sound waves into waves that the computer can actually understand. And then you run it through your filter code, and then run it back through the opposite process you did before from digital to analog and then you send it to your output which in this example is a speaker. So why are filters used? Going back to this low pass filter, um, as, as uh, has already been mentioned, low pass filters can be used in woofers and that kind of gives more of that bass, um, low frequency uh, sound that everyone's familiar with in regards to woofers. So in regards to looking at frequency response, something that is very important is the Bode plot. The Bode plot shows how a system responds with respect to frequency, um, and the Bode plot always has two plots. The top part is the magnitude, which is in decibels, um, on the y-axis and the x-axis is hertz, and the second part of that, the lower graph, is the phase, which is measured in degrees. So there is a condition known as linear phase, which says that uh, phase responds linearly uh, to frequency, and you can see on these pictures that the top two, the phase is indeed responding linearly, and the bottom two, the phase is not responding linearly. So the main advantage to having a linear phase system is that the delay is the same for all frequencies. This is very important for audio processing because you don't want different frequencies to be playing faster than other parts of, of your music. Um, you want all of them to stay at the same uh, speed. So for sampling, what's happening is, um, let me back up. So you'll have a signal, and what happens is that signal is actually sampled. So at certain time intervals, it's checking to see what essentially the, uh, the Y value is. And so for sa um, sampling, you have your uh, units of a sample per second, which would be in hertz. So um, the sampling, it, it, it gets more accurate the more you take um, 
per second, the more samples you get per second. That way you can better reconstruct your wave. Um, and if you, if you sample at too low of a frequency, you will lose quite a bit of your, your original wave. So for the theory behind sampling, the Nyquist sampling theorem says that your sampling frequency must be two times your greatest frequency in, in your spectrum. So human hearing generally goes from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So for sampling frequency, um, we need to be higher than 40 kilohertz. Um, and for this project, we picked 48 kilohertz. So there are two different types of filters, um, FIR and IIR. Um, the FIR is the finite impulse response, which says that it goes to zero in finite time. And the IIR is infinite impulse response. Um, there is actually a third type of filter, but it is outside the scope of this project. So different advantages to the different types of filters. The FIR can be easily designed to be linear phase, which as already mentioned is very important for audio processing because you want the delays for all of your um, frequencies to be the same. Um, it is simpler to implement on a digital signal processing board and it is inherently stable. The main advantage to the IIR is that it requires less memory and calculations to achieve the desired response. Um, so modeling different mod so that was the different types of filters, the different models of filters. We looked at four main ones, which was the Chebyshev 1, the Chebyshev 2, the elliptical, and the Butterworth. And this is the magnitude portion of that Bode re uh, response, the Bode plot. And so what's happening here is they're all transitioning from zero down to a negative 12, and they're all transitioning roughly at 1,000 hertz. Um, but you can notice there, is, there are differences in how these systems uh, respond. There are different ripples before and after the transition, and the different systems respond, uh, they, they transition either faster or slower based on the system. So which filter model should we use for the digital signal processing board? The Butterworth model was found to be the best of the models that we tested, the four different ones. So we found this by looking at the Bode plots for each and observing the phase, because we wanted as close to linear phase as we could get for the frequencies to be in sync. Um, and so we, we determined, since this is dealing with audio, that the phase response was indeed more important than the magnitude response. Um, and as already mentioned, a bad phase response could give delay in certain frequencies. So keeping in mind that the phase is more important than the magnitude, we chose that the best option is the FIR rather than the IIR. And those different models apply to IIR, so we don't have to worry about those. Um, so the reason that this was chose was once again because FIR is easily designed to be linear phase. I'm going to tell you a little bit about DSP chips now. Um, they are basically a special processor developed for to manipulate audio and video signals, especially for um, filters and everything. Uh, they're more cost effective and they um, perform better than microcontrollers that you would use. Because Whenever you're manipulating these signals and stuff, it requires a lot of math calculations and everything, and they have special hardware built in for that, and they operate faster so you don't have to deal with any delays. Uh, the first hardware that we used was the DSP56720, and we really didn't get much use out of that board. Uh, it used a, it used a really big 25-pin uh, serial port to connect and most serial, Windows 7 doesn't even support serial ports anymore. Um, most serial ports that I could find either ran or made run printers specifically and not to run peripherals. Uh, the programming software was, I'd never used it before. It was really outdated. I really couldn't figure it out that well and we couldn't even get it to get recognized by the computer anyway. So after that, we decided to switch to a different uh, board which is a CSM 56F801. Uh, the good thing about it is that it works with the Code Warrior software. And if you've taken any of the embedded systems classes or anything, that's what we use in all those classes. So we were really familiar with it. Um, there was no digital analog converter on it. So if we wanted to use that, we'd have to hook one up outside of that. Um, 
the analog digital converter is only 12 bit and for audio you want a little bit more than that um, the reason why that matters is because the higher the bits on your converters the more points you have to sample at and the more accurate your data can be and there was only one spy port so we could only connect uh, one uh, exterior peripheral to it so if we wanted to use a higher analog to digital converter we couldn't because it would already be taken up by using a digital thing or analog to digital. Uh, the problems with it is that we needed to buy a USB tap to be able to de debug the board. Uh, we couldn't find any of the drivers for it. Uh, the software that we had was outdated and there was a workaround needed for the Windows 64 bit. Uh, finally, we figured out that we needed, we got the right version of Code Warrior to install and that updated our drivers for us automatically and got it to connect. Um, with Windows 7, we did try to do the workaround and it really wasn't working out. We got it to actually connect to the computer and recognize it, but it still wouldn't talk to it. So then we decided to switch to a Windows XP virtual machine installed on Windows 7, and that way it could connect to it successfully. Then we tried programming it and that ended up being a tougher job than what we expected. Uh, I think the, re the reference manual we were looking through to try and get stuff to work was 700 pages long. And we spent probably 16 hours just trying to get an LED to light up, which we eventually did, but not very consistently. After that, we decided to try and get a real-time response at all, that we would switch again to the HC12 uh, processor. Um, we all, me and Eli both had experience programming this processor before, and overall support for it was better through Code Warrior and everything. Um, doing something like turning LEDs on and off, there was already functions written for that, so it would be really easy. Uh, the cons is that it was, it's a lot slower than the DSP boards, so you'd have to be really careful implementing a filter on it uh, as far as sampling and everything else goes. Uh, the A to D converter was only 8-bit. Well, programming wasn't that hard at all. Uh, the board synced right up to the computer, and the libraries were well built, like I said before. And we actually found some uh, code already implementing a uh, digital filter that we could use as a reference. Uh, this is our basic code design. Uh, first, we just initialize our components set everything up so everything knows how to talk to each other. Uh, we get the sample, filter it, output it, and then check to see if it was time to get a new sample yet or not. It was pretty easy. Uh, the filter code was designed using a first in, first out input buffer and used uh, multiplying accumulate instructions, which is where you take one uh, piece of data, multiply it times another, and then add another one to it, which is very essential in implementing a digital filter. So we did implement this into LabVIEW, um, and we looked at the, uh, you can see the, the top graph is a 500 hertz sine wave being passed into our filter with our filter cutoff um, being at 1,000 hertz. And you can see between the input and the output, it's virtually the same signal. So then we passed in a 1,500 hertz sine wave with our, once again, our frequency cutoff being at 1,000 hertz, and you can see that our signal is indeed being attenuated. So even though it's a little bit hard to see than if it were in the frequency domain, you can see that our filter was indeed working um, in regards to attenuating the higher frequencies. Um, and then we passed in white noise, or we passed in random noise, um, into our IIR low pass Butterworth filter, and you can see that the um, that the magnitude response, which is just above that bottom graph there, it is indeed uh, going down, it is declining right around a thousand hertz, it's roughly uh, negative four decibels. And you can also see that the phase response, which is, which is that bottom graph, is, it's not exactly linear, but it's, it's pretty, it's as close as we were going to get for this. Uh, these are budget costs. 
Uh, most of it was in labor because the only thing that we really was necessary to buy for this project was the USB tab. So in conclusion, the FIR Butterworth had the, the best um, response. The, the FIR um, was also fairly practical to be implemented on the DSP. Uh, and we achieved our goal of actually interfacing the original DSP. Um, we just didn't have enough time left to try and interface it and get all the programming down. Uh, the HDS12 was more practical and we got pretty close to being able to implement a filter on it. Uh, we were able to read data in and send data out, but that's as far as we got. So for special thanks and acknowledgement, we would like to thank Dr. Paul Cuban, our project advisor, um, Donna Moore, for being awesome and very helpful. Um, my parents, Jim and Marilyn Kern, and John's parents, John and Susan Stanfield. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, Dr. Kissel. Yes. Did you guys look at any responses in the digital frequency domain? Or did you have any plots or, or work in, in the, the digital domain? <clears throat> uh, no, sir. We mostly looked at our responses in regards to the um, continuous signals. No, there's other applications like uh, reading data from like two pressure sensors and pressure sensors and stuff like that. Okay. And is, would, would you be able to, with what you did, would you be able to code in different cutoff frequencies? Or would that be hard, would that be hard coded into your uh, in the, software? In the software on the DSP, uh, no, that's not in there. Uh, the numbers we came up with were from our requirements that we had, and then Eli got the coefficients from that, and then I would just put in the code.